All right, so the last several months I've been talking about Babylon. And I know some of you have been here for all of them. Uh, some of you probably haven't been to anyone. This might be your first one. But last time I spoke on Babylon, which was several weeks back, uh, I touched on the topic of the king of Babylon. And if you recall, uh, the king of Babylon, we went through the book of Daniel and we saw that the king of Babylon mingled the worship of God with paganism. Uh, also, the king of Babylon, as we read in uh, the book of Daniel, he put the Israelites, specifically the young male Israelites, the cream of the crop, he would put them through a Babylonian system of education to teach them how to become Babylonians. Now, also, he put them on the king's diet. As you recall, in Daniel chapter 1, he put them on the king's diet. In Daniel chapter 3, we saw that he used music or all sorts of music to entice them to worship a false idol. So these are all ways that the king of Babylon is using methods that he uses to get God's people, God's faithful people, to hook them and bring them into Babylon and to make them Babylonian. Well... We talked about that, and we asked the question, well, who is the king of Babylon? Is it Nebuchadnezzar? Was it his grandson, Bel Belshazzar? Or is it somebody else? Well, when we look to Isaiah chapter 14, a verse that most of you are very familiar with, Isaiah 14 and verse 4, it says, Thou shalt take up this proverb against who? <laughs> against the king of Babylon. So Isaiah 14 and verse 4 uh, it starts off as saying, give this proverb, take, take up this proverb, proverb against the king of Babylon. Well, if you go down several verses, if you follow this proverb, in verse 12, it actually lists who the king of Babylon is. It says, how art, th how art thou fallen from heaven, O who? Lucifer, son of the morning. How art thou cut down to the ground, which did weakest the nation? And so we see here that in a sense, or in a larger sense, the king of Babylon, the king over all of the system known as Babylon, is Satan himself. Now, today we're going to be talking about a cosmic warfare. A cosmic warfare. Now, and we're going to be speaking about the fallen angel, Lucifer, who rebelled in heaven, and we're going to be looking at the big picture. So we looked at the king of Babylon. We're going to be looking at the big picture of his kingdom and how it started, why it started, and some of the moves that he has made in rebellion, rebellion against God. So cosmic warfare. Has anybody in here ever played the game of chess? Is everybody familiar with the game of chess? You're at least familiar with it, right? Is anybody uh, any good in here? <laughs> You're pretty good. Okay. You don't play it anymore. Well, chess is an abstract strategy game. And that means that the game or the theme of the game is not necessarily important to the experience of playing. If you've ever played chess, what's that? Chess. Yeah, the game of chess. Uh, you don't think much about the theme in general. You focus on the strategy, and you probably focus on the individual pieces, uh, what each piece does, and then how to move and what strategy you're going to use in order to defeat your opponent. But really, overall, the theme really is something to think about, and I hadn't really thought about it. Before, uh, I would say this last week, it just kind of popped into my head as I started to think about it. But chess was created in the 15th century, at least the version that we know today. Or the version that we know today was created in the 15th century. Now, that's very interesting because I think to a degree, the chess setup or the chess board, the way that it's set up is actually kind of a history lesson. There's two opposing sides. One of them is white, one of them is black. So you have 
a light and a darkness. Now, since each side has a king, you're talking about two opposing what? Kingdoms. So you have two opposing kingdoms, a kingdom of light and a kingdom of? Of darkness. And the main point of the game is to do what? Capture the king. You want to capture and put the king in check. Now, notice the front row. Now, the front row is very interesting. The front row, they're all the same. And there's more of them. But you notice how they're kind of shorter than the, those in the back row? <laughs> you probably never heard anybody break down chess like this, right? <laughs> I, I find that to be very interesting, right? What do we call those ones in the front row? Pawns. We call them pawns. Yeah, and you've, you understand that, that, that today that's used as a derogatory term. Oh, that, uh, you know, oh, he's just a pawn. Meaning that he's being used by somebody higher up. Right, and so this is kind of a, something we see in the chess set here. That the pawns are on the front row, they're, they're expendable. So they go out first. And of course you don't want to lose them, but you can, you know, you, you'd be okay if you lose a couple of them. But the pawns. Now the back row represents the ruling class, the elites, so to speak. The pawns are the foot soldiers. They're not as valuable. Well, it kind of shows us how the world is run. I don't know. It's almost in, 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 a, in a sense a little picture of how the world was politically in the 15th century, in the Dark Ages. But it's really not much different today. Now, in the very end, you have a rook. And you have uh, a knight. Now, a rook looks like, what does a rook look like? A castle or a tower. So it represents a defense. Now, the knight uh, is obviously a horse, and a knight uh, is uh, somewhat offense. So you have defense and offense. You have the military forces on either side. Now, next to them, you have what's called a, a bishop. Now, the, the bishop has something very interesting in the top of it. They all have a little cut. You ever, you ever think about that? You ever think of, well, why, is a, why did he shape the, the, the chess piece, the bishop chess piece, why does it have that little slit on the top? Well, what was, so you could put your money in it? <laughs> That's a good one. Um, Keep in mind that when this was created, it was created in the Dark Ages. So when you talk about a bishop, who is a bishop? It's a Catholic priest. And so that little cut or slit right there is in the shape of the bishop's miter. You've probably seen that before. So this is why the, the chess piece. Now, a fi it's a fish hat. It's actually after the, the god uh, Dagon, which is the fish god. You can read about Dagon in the Old Testament. But what I find about interesting about the bishop and about chess is, is the layout, the layout of the bishop to the king. Now, the bishop sits right next to, on, on either side of the king and the queen. Now, that's very interesting. So you have a close relationship. It's a close relationship between the church, bishop, and the state, which is the king and queen. Now, this was common back, and this is, this is why this form of chess, now they say that there's earlier forms of chess, but this one created, that we know today, created around the 15th century, it actually tells us of what society was like, and, and that they all knew that next to the king and the queen, on either side, you had a bishop. Essentially, that the king or the, uh, or the queen, the bishop was always in their ear. And the more things change, the more things stay the same. And I don't think much has changed in that regard. Now, the way to win at chess is, how do you win at chess? What, how, how would you describe or what quality does a person need to have in order to be a good chess player? Strategy. I, I heard a couple things, but Gary said back there, they got to think ahead. Right? So that's the game of chess, that if you can, 
you got to think three or four steps ahead of your opponent. You got to be able to anticipate what he or she is going to do so that when they move, you're already ready to make a counter move. And then they're trying to think about what you're going to do. So there's this back and forth. The game of chess is back and forth of moves and counter moves. In a game of warfare between two opposing kingdoms, there's the chess set and then there's the players. The two players. And I share this because we're actually, it illustrates that we're actually in the middle of a cosmic chess match. A great controversy. Two kingdoms, a kingdom of light and a kingdom of darkness. And as one, as the kingdom of light makes a move, the kingdom of darkness makes a counter. And as the kingdom of darkness makes a move, the kingdom of light counters that one back and forth. This describes a great battle that is taking place throughout history between the forces of good and the forces of evil. Now that war, the cosmic warfare, started out. Now there wasn't multiple kingdoms. There was one kingdom in the universe, and that was the kingdom of God. But there was something that took place in heaven. A war started. A war broke out. And we're going to be looking at this today. We're going to be looking at the inception of another kingdom and some of the things that go behind that. So we're going to go back to Isaiah chapter 14 and verse 13. Speaking of Lucifer, and if you have your Bibles, you can follow along. Isaiah 14, verse 13. Speaking of Lucifer, it says, Thou hast said, where? In thine heart. Thou hast said, in thine heart. So where did sin originate? Heart. Right. And so where, where is the root problem of sin? Is it in the outward things that we do? No. Well, no, that's just the manifestation of something that takes place in the heart. So what came first? Lucifer saying in his heart or the action of rebellion? Well, it started in his heart and then it manifested in a rebellion. But it says, you said in your heart, I will do what? I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. And I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. So I highlighted those three words for a reason. The three words are ascend, throne, and sit. Now, what did Lucifer mean by saying that he wanted to ascend or I will ascend into heaven? What did he mean by that? Well, according to Ezekiel, we find out, because Ezekiel speaks about Lucifer as well, and we find out that Lucifer was already in heaven. It says, Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created, till something was found in thee. What was found in him? Iniquity. Iniquity was found in him. So he was an anointed cherub. Does anybody know what an, a cherub is, an anointed cherub? Do you know what that is in reference to? Right, it's an angel. Now, what do you think of, like, what article or furniture or how would you say it? <laughs> right, the Ark of the Covenant. So when you think of cherub, a cherub that covereth, you think of the Ark of the Covenant. Now, in the Old Testament, God had set up a, the sanctuary system. And in the very holiest place, he gave a description about the Ark of the Covenant. And on the Ark of the Covenant is the mercy seat. And over in the mercy seat is the two covering cherubs. And in between them is the, the Shekinah glory. That actually represents the very throne room of God. And the Shekinah represents the very presence of God. And the two angels are apparently two cherubs. One of those cherubs was Lucifer. Lucifer was in the very presence... The position of Lucifer in heaven was in the very presence of God, in his very throne room. 
So if anybody has an excuse or, or doesn't have an excuse, it would be Lucifer. Because Lucifer was right there next to God. And he knew God and he understood the character of God. And this is why the Bible calls it the mystery of iniquity. Because he was right there. He knew who God was and yet he still desired more. So Lucifer had the highest, really the highest position next to the Son of God. He was a covering cherub. So what does it mean that when he says, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. So he's not speaking, I will literally ascend into heaven because he was already there. He wanted to ascend in the sense of position and authority. He wasn't content with the position and the authority that he had. He wanted more. That is why he says, I will do what? I will exalt. I will exalt my throne. That is to lift up, ascend my throne, and, and establish my throne. Now, what is a throne? What does it represent? It represents power, authority. A throne is the very seat of power and authority. And the, the throne is occupied by a king. So Lucifer's iniquity was in coveting and aspiring authority, power, and control. No, nobody does that today. I mean, we've learned from this lesson. We, we read the Bible and we, we, we learn about Lucifer and... We don't do that, right? I mean, at least not Christians. I mean, that may be like in politics, but not in the church. I mean, church members don't clamor for power, authority, and control, and fame, and all of that, right? Because that, would be, that wouldn't be like Christ. That would be like Lucifer, because that's what Lucifer did. He desired, he coveted, he aspired authority, power, and control. I'm saying that somewhat facetiously because that's, we see, actually see that a lot in the Christian world today. But he wanted to set up his kingdom. He wanted to run the show. He wanted to call the shots. He wanted to set up his throne and his desire turned into action. And that action resulted in a war in heaven. A schism took place, a separation in the kingdom of God where there was one kingdom and everybody was in harmony and united there was a schism, a separation, a divide that took place, a civil war where there was now two opposing sides. But notice where he wanted to sit his uh, throne. He wanted to set his throne because he says very specifically, what does he say? He says, I will exalt my throne above what? Above the stars of God. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. What, is, what does that mean? What does that mean? Well, we can get a clue of the significance when we go to Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1, verse 12 and 13, it says, I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man. So John sees in vision, he sees candlesticks, uh, and he sees the Son of Man, or one like unto the Son of Man, which is who? Christ. He sees Jesus Christ in the sanctuary. Now watch this. It says, he had in his right hand seven what? Stars. Seven stars. Seven stars. Now if we go uh, a few verses further... We're actually given the interpretation. It says, The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And so here he's seen a, a, a vision. And, you know, there's symbolic language here. But when, it's, when, he, when he shows the seven stars in the right hands of Jesus, that is representing seven angels. And so in the Bible, when we look at the term star or stars, we can understand that that is a symbol for the angels. So when Lucifer says, I will set my throne above the stars of God, what was he wanting to do? 
He wanted to set his throne above the angels. He wanted to be in control and have power and authority over the angels. But there's only one problem. There was already someone over the angels. There was already somebody who was the head of the angels. So when Lucifer says, I will set my throne above the stars of God, what he was actually doing was he was coveting the very place of someone else who was already the head of the angels. Are you with me? Because I'm going to set my throne above the stars of God. Well, there's already someone there on the throne that is above the angels. Now, let's go a little bit further. And we're going to get into that a little bit more. But Revelation 12, verse 3 and 4, it says, There appeared another wonder. We're going to look at another vision in, in Revelation. There appeared another wonder in heaven, a great... A behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail, his what? Tail. His tail drew a third part of the what? Stars. The stars of heaven. Now, obviously, this is symbolic language. So we have to understand the symbols that are being used. Now, the dragon, who is the dragon? Well, it says that very clearly a little bit later on. I think it's verse, uh, verse 9. It says, the, the dragon is Satan, the devil, that old serpent. So we just looked at what stars represent. What does that represent? Angels. Angels. And so the devil or Satan, with his tail, drew a third part of the angels. Are you following along so far? A third part of the angels of heaven. Now, what is this mean by, by the tail? You know, there's not too many tails, T-A-I-L-S, in the Bible. But there is an interesting statement in Isaiah. Isaiah 9.15, it says, The ancient and honorable, speaking about a prophet, prophets, he is the head, and the prophet that teacheth lies is the what? Yes. So the prophet, uh, the tale is associated with a false prophet or one who tells lies. Tells lies. And so how is it that Satan was able to draw away a third of the angels of God? Through? Through lies. Well, this is no surprise. Jesus, when he was on earth in John 8, 44, he says, he, speaking of the devil, was a murderer from the beginning and he did not abide in the truth. There is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, when he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own. For he is a liar and the what? Father. So Satan is the father of lies. Father being or meaning that he is the originator. He is the originator of lying. He's the first one to lie. He's the first one to tell a lie. But it wasn't any kind of lie. It wasn't a bold-faced lie. It was a, a, a white lie, a subtle lie. It was deceptive. And you know, some of the most deceptive lies are those that are couched in truth. But a little bit of poison can still kill. Right? So he's the father. He's the father of it. And he drew a third of the stars or angels. And a result was in Revelation 12, 7, it says there was war where? In heaven. Now, you don't think of heaven as being a place of war. Most people think, well, heaven is perfect. There's peace and, you know, gr everything's green and there's flowers that don't fade away. And there's crystal clear water and everything is perfect. The lion and the lamb sit together. You don't think of war in heaven. But the Bible says here that there was a war in heaven. And there's two opposing sides here. It says, Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels. So notice there's the dragon, or Satan, Lucifer, and his angels, the fallen ones, the ones that he drew away through his lies. And then you have, on the other side, you have who? Michael. You have a person called Michael. So it's Michael versus Satan. And Michael's angels versus 
the fallen angels, Satan's angels. Now in Jude, Michael is called the what? The archangel. So this is Jude chapter 1, verse 9. It calls Michael the archangel. Now archangel is simply means the head or the chief of the angels. So when Lucifer desired to set his throne above the stars of God, he was really jealous and wanted the place of who? Michael, Michael the archangel. Now, who is Michael the archangel? That's really the question. Well, the term Michael means, does anybody know what Michael means? Yeah, who is like God? There's only one who truly fits the name Michael in the highest sense, and that's Christ. It's Christ, the Son of God, because the Bible says that Christ is the image of God. We'll read in Hebrews Chapter 1, verse 1 through 3, it says, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manner spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken unto us by who? Yes. By his Son. So the Father has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of how many things? All. Of all things. You think Satan was jealous of that? Yes. By whom he also made the world. So Christ... The Son of God participated with the Father and worked with the Father in the creation of all things. Is that right? Who, it says, being the brightness of His glory and the what? The express image of His person. So Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is called the express image image of his person. Now the word image is actually very similar to the idea of an idol or a graven image. You've heard of a graven image. So when it says he's the image, it's a copy or a carbon copy. How do you ever want to describe it? But he is the express image. No individual in all of the universe expresses the character and the image of God greater than his son, Jesus Christ. So who is like God? <laughs> so the name Michael, I find this interesting. The name Michael asks the question, who is like God? But the name Michael also answers the question, he who is like God. So Michael, or Jesus Christ, is the one who is like God. He's in the image or the express image of God. So now if you have any other doubt about who the archangel is, I know some people have a dispute with that, that Michael the archangel, and for a number of reasons, but I just want to point you also to, and we won't go into it very much, but 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. For the Lord himself, speaking of Jesus' second coming, it says, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. So the Lord himself, speaking of Jesus Christ, himself he shall descend from heaven with what? A with a shout. And he shall descend from heaven with the voice. voice of the archangel. And he shall descend from heaven with the what? Trump of God. And so when Christ comes the second time, it says that he comes with the voice of the archangel. Well, would that make sense? Because he is, or his pre-incarnate, before he came to this earth, he was Michael the archangel. Angel. Now, some people have a problem with the idea of saying Jesus is an angel because that would be associated with a created being. Now, nobody in here, as, I, as far as I know, believes that Jesus was a created being, not in the typical, at least not in the sense of the angels. So we go back to Exodus chapter 3. Now, I want you to notice this because the Old Testament, you actually find... Uh, references to Christ being the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament. In Exodus 3 is a perfect example. It says, Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And you should be familiar with this. The burning bush, it says, The angel of the Lord, the what? The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of the bush. 
So who is it that appeared to Moses out of the midst of the bush? Right, what does the verse say? It says the angel of the Lord, right? Are we, are we all on the same page with that? It says the angel of the Lord appeared. But in the verse later, it says, When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush. And he said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. Well, that's interesting, and it can be very confusing, uh, certainly for some people. But uh, the Lord saw that he turned aside. God called unto him out of the midst of the bush. So here you have in the, in the midst of the bush is the angel of the Lord. Now, what does angel mean? It means messenger. So the angel or messenger of the Lord is a specific person in the Old Testament. It was a specific person that the father had given as a mediator, as one who would watch over God's people and who would guide them through the wilderness, out of Egypt, through the wilderness and into the promised land. There is one individual that the Lord saw fit to do this work, and that is his son, Michael, or the angel of the Lord, as we read sometimes in the Old Testament. So he called to him out of the midst of the bush. Now, the angel or Christ that was in the midst of the bush was speaking on behalf of the Father in heaven. Now, notice this, Exodus 23, 20, it says, Behold, I send what? An angel before thee to keep thee in the way and to bring thee into the place where I have prepared. Beware of him and obey his voice. Provoke him not, for he will not do what? Pardon your transgressions, for my name is in him. Do you remember in Hebrews it says that he has obtained, Christ the Son of God has obtained a more excellent name. Well, here in the Old Testament we see that I'm going to send an angel before you my name is in him, and he will, you better listen to his voice because he will not pardon your transgression. Who is it that can forgive sins? Right. God. God can forgive sins. And he's committed all of the judgments unto his son. Christ can forgive sins. All right? Well, it's interesting, in Exodus 13, 21, it says, The Lord went before them. So I'm just showing these things because, really, some people have a hard time with Christ being the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament. Um, we need to take the word for what it says. Amen. Just take it for what it reads. It says he's the, the angel of the Lord. Um, that's not degrading to Christ in any way. Because he has a special role to play in the salvation of God's people all throughout history, and we see him working in the Old Testament. You know, a lot of people take half of their Bibles and they ignore it, over half, really. They ignore the Old Testament. But the problem is they don't see Christ in the Old Testament. They don't see Christ working through the duration of the Old Testament. Well, it was Christ... The divine son, Michael the archangel, the angel of the Lord that led him in the wilderness. And it was Michael, the same Michael, that fought against Lucifer and his fallen angels. So Satan's first move was to establish and build up his kingdom. And he went through it, and he established it on lies and deception, and re revealed the foundation of his kingdom, which is a kingdom of unrighteousness and a kingdom of darkness. Now, there came a time where God had to make a counter move. And that counter move, he couldn't just sit back and allow rebellion to fill up the heavenly courts. He had to make a move. Now, he wasn't quick to make a move, but he allowed it to play out, and then there came a time where he had to make a definitive decision. And that's when a war broke out. And it says in Revelation 12, 8, they prevailed not, neither was their place found anymore in heaven. The great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world, he was cast out into where? Into the earth. And his angels were cast out with him. And so Satan cast out into the earth. The angels were cast out with him. 
Now, Michael was there. Michael the archangel was there. And so that makes sense. In Luke chapter 10, Jesus commenting afterwards, he says, I beheld Satan as light, lightning. Do what? Fall from heaven. Well, that would make sense because he was there. He was the one that did it. So he was cast out of heaven. Now, he was cast out in more ways than one. It wasn't as though it's only focusing on being literally fallen or that Satan fell from heaven or he was cast out from heaven. I mean, that literally happened. But there's also something that, that also happened, that when he started to say in his heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. He was actually falling away or apostatizing from the very principles of heaven. He was falling. Well, instead of the unselfish love that pervaded the atmosphere of heaven, there was a cancer that originated, and it originated in the heart of the great rebel, and it spread, and that cancer is selfishness. Now, after he was banished to earth, Satan's next move was to secure something. What do you think it was? Because he can no longer cause chaos in heaven. He was banished to this earth. So what's his next gonna, move going to be? He wanted to secure the downfall of the human race, thereby allying them to his rebellion. Now, it says in Genesis 3, 1, it says, The serpent was more, what? Subtle. Subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. Satan successfully deceived one-third of the angels through lies or subtlety. And now that strategy is, is used or placed against Adam and Eve. Now, we can see it in the following verses. Genesis 3, 1, Satan comes to Eve and he says, Yea, hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Is that what God had said? Is that the way that God expressed it? How did God express it? He says, you can freely eat of everything except one. And then Satan comes along. He says, you shall, hasn't God said you shall not eat of every tree? So you see how Satan comes and he takes God's word and he takes the idea of obeying God and he places it in a negative light. Isn't that what he does? That's very subtle. That's very subtle. He, he was indicating that, look, God is withholding something from you. That was his insinuation. God is trying to withhold something from you. Now, let's read on. The woman said unto the serpent... We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said unto the woman, what did the serpent say? He says, you shall not surely die. Now, God had said, you shall surely die. The serpent says, you shall not. It's amazing how one word can change the whole meaning of a sentence. Satan said, you shall not surely die. So she was correct in saying that God said you should surely die. But Satan comes along and he contradicts and he says, you shall not surely die. Now, what is he insinuating about the character of God? What is he insinuating about the word of God? He's saying, God, look, you shall not surely die. God is lying to you. You can't believe him. You can't trust him. So the sin of Adam and Eve, or the sin of Eve, yes, there is a sin in, in, in the act of eating. But I think before that, that's, that's worse enough, right? In, in eating and disobeying God. That's bad enough. But I think what is worse is that she believed the words of the serpent over the words of God. She, accept, she accepted the accusation. So when she accepted the words of the serpent, 
essentially she agreed that God is a liar. What do you think hurt God more? The fact that they ate of the fruit or the fact that they believed a God of love, a God that is willing to do anything for them that his children believed, one of his children believed that he was a liar. What do you think hurt God's heart more? Right? So, and she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also to her husband with her and he did eat. Now, think about this. In getting Adam and Eve to eat the fruits, Satan did more than just gain some allies. He did more than just gain some allies. First of all, Adam and Eve, at the time, how many humans were there? Just the two of them. It was just the two of them. So in getting Adam and Eve, he got the whole human race. He got the whole human race. Now that's a problem. Because if you think about it, when war broke out in heaven, all of the angels, at least what we know and understand, all of the angels that exist already existed. And so simply, when the war broke out, they chose sides. Right? And so there was never a time when it was all of the angels that were on Satan's side. But there was a time when, when, when Adam and Eve sinned and they fell, all of humanity, the whole human race was lost. You understand that? The whole human race was now on Satan's side. They were a part of his kingdom. I think that's pretty significant. And because of the fall, Adam and Eve's posterity would be born with fallen natures, thereby almost virtually securing that every single one after him, after them, would also be on Satan's side. Satan stole, on top of that, Satan stole something that was given to Adam. Now, in Genesis 1, 27... And 28, when God created Adam and Eve, he says, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have what? Dominion. Dominion. Have dominion. So a dominion as the head and the highest species in in the earth, man was the head over all of the earth. And, And we still see that today. There's no other species on this planet that can have the level of judgment, reasoning, the ability to think, the ability to create. No other animal or species can do that. Not to the level of man. Now today, a lot of men and women are digressing and becoming more animalistic. Isn't that right? Where we don't, we just throw judgment out the window. We throw reason out the window. And because somebody says we should do something, we just follow along. The way the world works today. Follow the herd. Well, there was something that Satan took from Adam. And that was the dominion. The dominion that was given to him. And so he can now claim that Adam's dominion, or the dominion given to Adam, was now a part of his kingdom. So God set out immediately to implement a plan. That plan was a plan of salvation. Now, in response to the fall of man, God had to make another counter move. And a plan was implemented that could redeem the human race and yet gain back the dominion that was stolen from Adam. Now, one advantage that God has is that he can see into the future. Isn't that right? Right. And so he can see several moves ahead. And this is why God will always win. (laughs) Because he can see several moves ahead. Now, This is why God has a perfect response. In the cosmic warfare, God is always one step ahead. God saw the fall of man. He knew that was going to happen. And even before that, the Father and the Son 
met together in a council, and it was pledged that the Son of God should give his life, should become a man, have the victory where Adam failed, and then give his life as a ransom for sinful, fallen humanity and to secure their redemption. And this would justify the sinner, but at the same time uphold the justice of God. So that plan was immediately implemented in the garden. It says, I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now that enmity is Christ. That enmity that would be between, be between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent is Christ. Now the seed is speaking of the offspring, the children, or the offspring. And from... Adam and Eve came two lines of offspring. They came the seed of God, which is the seed of the righteous, and the seed of the serpent, or the seed of the woman. Two seeds. Now, in response to the promised Messiah that was given here, that I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed... Satan made another move. He went to quick work. And in Genesis 4, 8, we read, Cain talked, about, talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field. Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and did what? He slew him. Now, who inspired Cain with anger? Who inspired him to kill his brother? Satan did. We read that in 1 John chapter 3. It says, not of, as Cain, who was what? of that wicked one. And so when we go back to Genesis chapter 3 and we read about the seed of the woman and there being enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. Well, who was one of Satan's or the serpent's offspring? Cain was. It says Cain was of that wicked one. He was the seed of the serpent. He was the seed of the seed of the serpent. And he slew his brother Abel, which is of the faithful and righteous lineage. And followed after the principles of righteousness. And so God had to raise up another seed, and his name was Seth. And we read in Genesis 4.25 that uh, the name Seth there says, For God saith said she, hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel, whom Cain slew. Well, and then it uh, ends the verse there that after Seth had a son named Enos, it says, then began man to call on the name of the Lord. So Seth represents the seed or the line of men that would call upon the name of the Lord. And then there was Cain, who was of the serpents and of the line and, and, and of individuals and people who were in rebellion from God. Now, after it says uh, Cain continued in his rebellion. Now, I find this to be very interesting because after he slew his brother, what did he go do? He, flee, he fled. And then it says Cain knew his wife. So he dwelt in the land of Nod in the east of Eden. And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and buried Enoch, and he did what? He built a city. So here you have the line of Cain, or the seed of the serpent, and what do they go about doing? They go about building a city. Now that's very familiar, because there's somebody else, a little bit later on, that also was into building cities. Notice Genesis chapter 2, it says, The Lord God took the man... This is in Genesis chapter 2, talking about creation, and put him where? In a garden. So God's original plan was for man to be in a garden to do what? To dress it and to keep it. So mankind, the original purpose for mankind was to live a peaceful life in nature and to work the land. But after the fall, we see a, a split of two lines where one line was faithful to God and the other line of humans was following after the serpent. 
And, and those that were faithful, they lived a solitary life in nature, and they lived and worked with the land. Now watch this. Uh, when you follow the genealogy of Seth in Genesis chapter 5, verse 28, uh, Lamech it says that he lived 180 and two years old and begat a son and called his name Noah, saying, this, shall, this same shall comfort us concerning our, what? Our work and the toil of our hands because of the, because of the ground which the Lord has cursed. So we, we go all the way to Noah, and Lamech is talking about... Well, we're going to get comfort because we've been working hard in the ground and in the land. And so the faithful line of, of, uh, from, from Seth, or, or, or the line of God, or the seed of the woman, they were working in the fields. But what did Cain's line do? He went and he built up a city. So there was, a, for a time, a separation between the two different lines, between the followers of God and the followers of the devil. So Satan had to change his strategy. So the first thing he tried to do was eliminate the seed by killing Abel. But that didn't work because God raised up Seth. So what did he do? He had to change up his strategy. And he did that by mingling the two different lines. Because we read in Genesis 6, God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination, I think I missed a verse here. Yep. It came to pass when men began to multiply in the face of the earth, the daughters were born unto them and the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair and they took them wives of all which they choose. Now, some people interpret these series of passages to say that either aliens or fallen angels came and impregnated some of the women on the earth. And that's what caused giants. Um, I think the more plausible explanation is when we understand the seed of the woman versus the seed of the serpent. There was two lines, one that was faithful to God and one that was in rebellion. And what Satan did was change up his strategy and he got the two of them to mingle together so that the sons of God, those that were faithful and had learned the truth of what had happened and decided to be faithful and obey God, they started to marry those daughters of men that were rebellious. And what did that do? What was the result of that? Well, it was a very good strategy on Satan's part. Because God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So there came a time that strategy worked so well that the whole world, except for really Noah and his family, eight souls, but not even all eight of them survived the flood. So God had to move in a desperate measure, the whole world was being overrun and almost overtaken by wickedness. God sent a flood, and he destroyed all of mankind. He wiped the board. He started again. But shortly after the flood, the warfare continued. And Satan inspired a man, uh, a man to follow after the rebellion of Cain. That was Nimrod. We talked about him. And he set up... Right in line with Cain and the seed of the serpent, he went out and he set up a kingdom and he set up and started building cities. But he went a step further than Cain. He built multiple cities. He established a kingdom and an empire in order to exert authority and control over the whole world. But Nimrod's kingdom was not his own. He was only a piece on the chess board. <laughs> He was being controlled by the real player behind the scenes. Now, through the rest of the Old Testament, and we're not going to go through all of it, but we see God establishing the kingdom of Israel. And the purpose was to preserve the principles of righteousness. All through the Old Testament, God was trying to preserve a faithful people, a faithful seed. But Satan kept on different strategies. And as God made a move, Satan would make a move. 
and then God would make a move. All in order to preserve a faithful line of people. Well, Satan, through Nimrod and then other various empires, tried to control the whole world, including those that would be faithful to God. And so he worked through Babylon of old. He worked through Egypt, the Pharaohs, the Philistines, the Assyrians, the Neo-Babylonians with Nebuchadnezzar. He worked through the Medo-Persian Empire, the Greeks, and Rome, and all throughout history and all throughout the Old Testament. He was constantly raising up as his tool or pawn these kingdoms. Now, bi biblical history reveals a back and forth, a strategic warfare between Christ and Satan, between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. Uh, Satan says, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars. He desired the place of Christ. He was jealous. It was jealousy over the Son of God that brought about the rebe rebellion. It was jealousy over Christ that brought about the tr all the trouble that we see in the world today. So that battle started in heaven. It spilled over to this planet, and each one of us have a part to play in this cosmic warfare. Everyone must choose a side. Amen. And the question this morning, are you of the seed of the woman? Are you of the faithful line of individuals? Are you of that rebellious one? Are you choosing to be on God's side today? Do you believe in his word? Are you living by faith? Do you trust your life to his providence and care? Are you separating yourself from the things of this world? From the temptations of the king of Babylon? Are you obeying his words? Or are we following after the, the way of Cain, of Nimrod? of the wicked and rebellious seed, living a life of defiance and self-reliance self and rebellion against God. Now you may say, I might not drink or gamble or do drugs or chase relationships, or I'm not very materialistic, or you know, I'm not into entertainment or any of these things, but even in a religious context, we can be following after the serpent. You know, Lucifer had an eye problem. He says, I will ascend, I will exalt my throne, I will put my place, I will sit. He says, I, I, I. You ever met anybody like that? All they want to do is talk about themselves, and they're not interested in other, others. Uh, that's the very principle of Satan's kingdom. It goes beyond an external, goes beyond just what we do, but what we do is a manifestation of what's in the heart. And the problem of Satan and the whole controversy and his kingdom is based upon one principle, and that's the love of self. It's a love of self that is the ruling principle of, God's, uh, of Satan's kingdom. And throughout human history, Satan has demonstrated that principle in the various kingdoms of this world. It's all about self-preservation. Every organization that you can think of in this world, every organization, once it's organized and it gets big enough, the self-preservation of that organization becomes the mission. Isn't that right? Yeah. Whether it's a corporation, a church, or an organization, the survival of that becomes the most important thing. It's really a principle of the Satan's kingdom. To put others down and to conquer others so that I can lift myself up. You know, people do that today. You see it all the time. Yes. I hear it in many sermons, really. I hear it in many sermons. Always cutting somebody else down in order to lift yourself up. Always attacking somebody else's belief or opinion or saying something about somebody else. I have an idea. How about we just present the truth? How about we just present the truth and let it speak to, for itself? So there's always, throughout all of history, this principle of Satan's kingdom has been demonstrated. 
taken by force and bloodshed in order to glorify themselves above others. And when the Son of God came, he demonstrated the very heart and principle of God's kingdom, which is a self-sacrificing love. That doesn't come natural to each one of us, does it? The other one comes natural to us. Selfishness, a love of self. That's something we all face and are struggling with and we have to fight against because that's the very principle of Satan's kingdom. And each one of us come with that baggage. But the power of God and the power of God's kingdom is greater. Amen? Amen. The power of the principle of self-sacrificing love demonstrated in the life and sacrifice of Christ is more powerful than anything Satan can do or the principle of his kingdom. Now, Satan sacrifices others for personal benefit. Christ sacrificed himself for the benefit of others. The last, last line, I'll read it again. Satan sacrifices others for his own personal benefit. Christ sacrificed himself for the benefit of others. It's two kingdoms, two principles. This is the way it's always been throughout history. The war has morphed and changed shapes over the years, but it's still the same. Two kingdoms, two principles. Which one do you belong to? Let's pray. Oh, Father. Oh, Father. We are in the midst of a great spiritual war. And, Father, there's many people around around us that have no idea, no clue of what is actually taking place in our world. Father, open our eyes to see our condition and our true lack of righteousness. And Father, may we see Christ and his sacrifice and the very principle of your kingdom, may we see that more clearer in our hearts and minds. And may that self-sacrificing love of Christ burn in our hearts so that we may follow his example. And Father, I just pray for each and every person in here that we may be a part of your true kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen.